Welcome to the Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church Sunday School Lesson for Sunday, March 19th, 2023. Uh, this is Deacon Barry Taylor. Uh, we are in Lesson 3 of the um, Spring Quarter, Unit 1 of the Faith Pathway Adult Quarterly. Uh, our lesson, uh, the unit title is Call from the Margins of Society. Call from the Margins of Society. And our lesson title is Different But the Same. Different But the Same. Our key verse, actually our devotional reading, is taken from Isaiah chapter 44, verses 1 to 8. Our background scripture is taken from John, the Gospel of John, chapter 4 verses 1 to 42 and our print passage or our lesson text is taken from the gospel of john chapter 4 verses 7 to 15 verses 28 to 30 and verses 39 to 41 our key verse is john chapter 4 verse 39 which reads from the King James Version, many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman, which testified, he told me all that ever I did. Our lesson aims from the quarterly or number one, compare and contrast societal barriers in Jesus' time to the barriers that exist in the church today. Number two, confess your tendency to allow differences to hinder relationships. And number three, offer hospitality to someone who is different from yourself. Now, after the introduction, uh, our lesson outline has three divisions. The first is entitled, Confronting Societal Barriers. Confronting Societal Barriers. That's covered between John chapter 4, verses 7 and 9. The second is entitled, Confronting Spiritual Blindness. That's covered between chapter 4, verses 10 and 15. And the third division is titled, Hearing, Seeing, Believing. And that's covered between John chapter 4, verses 28 and 30 and then verses 39 to 41. From the standard commentary, our lesson title is Jesus Talks with a Samaritan. Jesus Talks with a Samaritan. And additional aims are, number one, identify the barriers that Jesus ignored when talking with the Samaritan woman. Number two, explain the significance of Jesus' discussion with the woman in light of the prevailing cultural, political, and religious taboos he ignored. And then number three, identify elements of Jesus' approach to evangelism that he or she will use, or that is that you or I will use. We have a great lesson today, and before we we get into a little discussion of the background, let's go before the throne. Our Father, our Lord, and our God, we thank you for another opportunity, another privilege to study your precious word. We thank you for, Lord, such understanding as you have given us, and Lord, we know while this is a familiar passage, uh, there is always something more to learn, Lord, that you would have us to learn. And not only learn, but you'd have us to, to heed, Lord. You'd have us, uh, our faith and our obedience, to be increased uh, after understanding uh, your word. So we pray for that today, Lord, that you give us understanding as to how we are to treat all, Lord. Uh, the same uh, how we are to uh, ignore uh, cultural barriers and barriers that we have erected ourselves to divide ourselves, Lord, and to see all in need of your salvation. We thank you again for this privilege of studying your word, and we ask for your understanding and your obedience to it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we are um, in the gospel according to John, and it is well known that this gospel was written by the apostle john 
he does not identify himself uh, in the gospel except for to say that he is the one whom Jesus loved and it is established that uh, that one was none other than the Apostle John it was written uh, after the other Gospels, the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, perhaps around 80, between 80 and 90 AD, uh, and before John writes uh, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, the Epistles and Revelations. Now, John is the Gospel, I believe, that presents Jesus more clearly uh, as God incarnate than any other. So if you've got a red letter Bible, um, you notice that there's a lot more red in the Gospel of John, uh, which are uh, the things which really identify the things that Jesus said about himself, who he was, why he came, and so forth. And John capsulizes his reason for writing the gospel in John 20 uh, 31 and it reads from the NIV these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah the Son of God and that by believing you may have life in his name and that is eternal life the gospel of John was written and it did not include as many miracles as some of the other gospels but they were more than enough to convince us of who Jesus is, that he is the Messiah, the Son of the living God, and in believing we might have eternal life. That was the purpose for him writing this gospel. So we know in, in chapter 3, those of you who are familiar with the gospel of John, we know in chapter 3, uh, Nicodemus, a member of the Sanhedrin, comes to Jesus by night and asks who he is and and so forth and Jesus tells him and and tells him about the rebirth uh, and we we see now in um, chapter 4 now let's contrast that Nicodemus came to Jesus for answers uh, we see in chapter 4 that that Jesus himself uh, has an ordained a preordained appointment with uh, someone in Samaria he must need to go through Samaria and I I kind of hate to start uh, a lesson text uh, just a little before the beginning of a chapter. So if you'll indulge me for just a minute, I will read very quickly the first four verses of chapter four from the uh, New King James Version. And it reads, therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though he himself did not baptize but his disciples says parenthetically he left Judea and departed again to Galilee but he needed to go through Samaria because there was some um, uh, conflict about to start between who baptized more John uh, his cousin John or him he left uh, to go to Galilee you know Galilee Judea was south of this central region of uh, of Israel uh, called Samaria and Galilee which was north of this region he said he must need he but he needed to go through Samaria so he came to a city of Samaria which is called Sychar near the plot of the ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph now Jacob this is verse 6 now Jacob's well was there Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus and by, by the well. And it was about the sixth hour. Okay, now, it's a three, approximately a three-day journey from Jerusalem to Galilee through Samaria. We know that the Jews customarily had two routes around Samaria because they wanted to avoid any contact with the Samaritans. We'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. But they have begun the journey, and we don't know if they are uh, perhaps midway through Samaria. This Sychar is about a half a mile from this well uh, that is going to be spoken of. And uh, the um, 
and, and it's midday, it's noon, it's the sixth hour of the day. And Jesus, being human, being fully man and fully God, is wearied by the journey and no doubt thirsty in the arid region. So our lesson picks up at verse 7, and I'm going to read uh, from the first division again from the quarterly which is entitled confronting societal barriers uh, but before I do that let me just um, say at the outset just kind of give a a broad overview of what we want to learn what we will be learning in the lesson today or being be reminded of I know we know these things already and that is that God makes no distinctions um, uh, does not make the distinctions that we do. Certainly he recognizes their different races. He recognizes their different social statuses and all of that. But he makes no difference when it comes to meeting our needs and our need principally, our primary need, and that is for salvation. That is deliverance from the penalty of our sin, from the power of our sin, and ultimately from the very presence of our sin. We are all in need of God's salvation. And so when it comes to evangelizing or spreading the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, that he died for our sins, he bore our sins on a cross, that we might have eternal life. We are to do that without respect to uh, social status, race, uh, culture, uh, any man-made barriers. Now, not to say that we don't recognize that there are differences, but we are not to make any distinctions when it comes to uh, spreading the gospel or sharing the gospel the good news with all so verse uh the first passage verses not verse chapter 4 verses 7 to 9 uh from the niv let's read the niv it says and when a samaritan woman came to draw water jesus said to her will you give me a drink in parentheses verse 8 his disciples had gone into the town to buy food Verse 9, the Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? In parentheses again, for the Jews do not associate with the Samaritans. Well, let's back up here to verse 7, which reads again, When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me to drink. Now we know the King James Version is more declarative. It says, give me to drink. Uh, and now there's some things that we want to make note of. Uh, we've already said that it was noonday in verse 6. It was the sixth hour, which was an unusual time for a woman to come to the well to draw water. And let's let's just get over this, uh, uh, this little cultural uh, issue here. Yes, the women drew the water typically the men did not uh, and usually they drew the water in the morning uh, and perhaps in the evening but they did not come in the heat of the day uh, to draw water and they came usually in groups uh, perhaps for protection or company or whatever but they came in groups this woman is alone midday at an odd hour to draw water and of course Jesus is sitting on or near the well and ask her uh, to give him to drink and she is astonished by the question and by him even speaking to her uh, it's noted in verse 8 that his disciples had gone into the town to buy food and that town most likely was Sychar again which is about a half mile from the well from where this well was why was the woman astounded? Well, she says, she said, I am a Jewish, I mean, I am a Samaritan woman. So first of all, the, it was culturally taboo for a man to speak to a woman, even his wife in public, okay? Uh, conversations between men and women were to be held in private, and particularly men and his, and his wife or man and sister, whatever, were to be held in private, not in public. Secondly, the Jews, and, and it's told us in verse 8, uh, I'm sorry, it, it, it tells us in verse 9 that the Jews had nothing to do with the Samaritans. Now, why was that? Well, uh, this, this goes back 
uh, some 700 years uh, when the Assyrians captured uh, and took captive the the northern kingdom and actually uh, took most of those people away they left some people in the land and they brought other peoples with strange customs and religions into the land of Israel and over the years over the centuries they commingled with uh, the Jewish remnant that was left in the land and created a mixed race a mixed race and not only were they mixed uh, bloodline wise but culturally mixed the only um, uh, word that the Samaritans recognized of God were, were the first five books of the Bible the books that Moses wrote the, the Pentateuch uh, and they did not uh, recognize or pay attention to the prophets uh, to the uh, uh, to the Psalms and uh, they certainly obviously the gospel hadn't been written in so they um, and they had some other uh, mixed uh, ideas about uh, about God because again of the influence of those they were intermixed with racially so in other words the the, the Jews if you will the uh, the full-blooded, blue-blooded uh, Jews didn't want to have anything to do with what they con considered to be mongrels or uh, mixed uh, mixed race people, uh, and uh, and that was to to maintain their own pure bloodlines, if you will, their own distinct uh, family uh, lineage, and uh, so go, let's move on to verse nine, and verse nine reads. So, so that, those are the reasons, again, that she was astounded that Jesus would even talk to her. She was a woman. He's talking to her in public, and he's asking her for something. And the third reason is uh, th there was some uh, ceremonial defilement that uh, would have uh, happened had, he, had Jesus drank from uh, a Samaritan uh, uh, vessel, whatever she uh, would withdraw the water with. Uh, if Jesus had drank for that, there was some uh, ceremonial defilement that uh, 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 that he would uh, uh, that would happen to him, if you will. Let's move on to verse nine. Verse nine reads: The Samaritan woman said to him, "You are a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for drink?" Again, for the Jews do not associate with the Samaritans, and I pretty much covered that as to why she was astounded by him asking her to drink let's move on to our second uh, division well first there's a question here after the first one and it says what are the societal barriers preventing or hindering people's witnessing to the outcasts of society in your community how can they be overcome are there outcasts in our community are there uh, socially unaccepted or unacceptable people in our community? Sure, there are. There are people that uh, unwarily uh, we uh, avoid uh, street people, uh, homeless people, uh, people of different races, uh, people that are, have addictions of various sorts, alcoholism, drug, drug abuse, whatever. Uh, and then people that have, uh, of course, uh, different faiths that uh, we perhaps don't want to challenge. Uh, I, I remember years ago uh, having a good friend who was uh, Islamic and uh, spending hours and hours uh, talking to him about the Lord and about the gospel. And he even came to church with me several times and he was willing to listen. And uh, of course, he told me about his faith and what he believed. And we, of course, compared and contrasted our beliefs. And the one thing that uh, I remember really catching him, really uh, uh, catching his attention was the fact that uh, I knew that I was saved. I, I, I had no doubt. I didn't have to pray five times facing Mecca. I didn't have to wonder if uh, having uh, done everything that I knew to be right all my life, that I still wouldn't know at the point of death whether I was going to heaven or not. And he really uh, was astounded by that, by the fact that I could have assurance of my salvation. Um, 
never I never saw the the, the fruit but uh, I at least planted the seed uh, of the true gospel so let's move into so so again uh, there are uh, outcasts in society that we want to approach with the gospel we uh, uh, and we want to not discriminate against them let's move into again our second division which is entitled confronting spiritual blindness that's covered between John chapter 4 verses 10 and 15 again I'll read from the NIV beginning at verse 10 Jesus answered her if you knew the gift of God and who it and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Verse 11, Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become a in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw. Now the overview of this passage is Jesus is trying to convey some spiritual truth to the woman but she is understanding what he is saying in physical terms. She is uh, 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 not understanding uh, what he is speaking of because she's thinking about physical water and he is talking about something spiritual. We're going to get into this in just a moment here so let's back up to verse 10 and it reads Jesus answered her when she asked of course verse 9 what, what, what you know why are you having anything to do with me and he didn't address that he didn't address that directly he said but if you, in other words he didn't explain why he was having something to do with her he said if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Well, he is the gift of God, the Messiah, the Lord Jesus, first of all. But he is saying, he's speaking of living water that he would give her. So what is that? living water that he is speaking of. I said a minute ago the gift of God was uh, the Lord Jesus and certainly it is but it's the more specifically the Holy Spirit okay and uh, there's several several uh, verses and passages in the Bible that speak of this living water. Living water uh, from a physical perspective is a spring is running water or moving water something that's gushing uh as opposed to static a uh, static uh, water like the dead sea or a, a stagnant lake or pond but throughout the bible uh, it is uh symbolic of the holy spirit and the holy spirit's work uh we're going to go back to uh just a just a couple of Old Testament verses, and then a few a couple of New Testament verses uh, to kind of illustrate uh, what is meant here. Uh, further clarify Jeremiah two thirteen. So in Jeremiah two thirteen, God is chastising the people for what? It reads, "For my people have committed two evils; they have forsaken me." the fountain of living water, the source of living water, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water, that can hold no water. Let's look at uh, Zechariah. Now this is at the, in the end times now, when he's speaking of uh, this living water that will flow from uh, Jerusalem, uh, chapter 14. And verse 18 uh, from Zechariah reads, And if the family, hold on, 
sorry, it's Zechariah 14, 8, and it reads, And it shall be in that day, again talking about the end days when the Lord sets up his kingdom, that living water shall go out from Jerusalem, half of them towards the former sea and half of them towards the hinder sea. In summer and in winter shall it be. In other words, there shall be a continuous flow of this living water symbolizing the Holy Spirit. Let's move to uh, John, uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 6 and 35, verse 35, where Jesus says, and it says, And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. And let's move over to uh, chapter 7, John chapter 7, and we're going to read verses uh, 38 and 39. And again, as we do this, we, we, we need to use scripture to interpret scripture. So to understand what this living water is, we need to know where it was referred to and in what context contexts elsewhere in the Bible. Verse 38 uh, uh, reads, He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But, in parentheses 39, this spake he of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, capital S here, which they that believed on him should receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given, that was given at Pentecost, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. So it's very clear here as to what Jesus is referring to when he talks about the living water that he will give, he would give this woman. In fact, he's given this living water to every believer. We have all been indwelt by the Holy Spirit. We have the power of the Holy Spirit available to us to spread the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, and to do every other good work that the Lord has commanded us to do. Now, as we will prog progress <laughs> through our passage, through this passage, we see that the woman is, is confused. And quite honestly, had you never read the Bible, uh, or understood this passage from a spiritual point of view, you'd be confused as well. So let's look at 11a, and I'm going to go back and forth uh, between the NIV and the King James. 11a from the King James said, The woman said unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with. Okay, well, the woman uh, is, is again thinking physically and that, hey, if you got some, she's thinking that this living water is some spring, perhaps at the bottom of the well, and that uh, he needs a bucket or something to draw from this fresh spring that's at the bottom of the well. And as she's going to say, uh, later the well is deep. Verse uh, 11b and 12, verses 11b and 12 say, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? Okay, so the well we, we, we learn from other sources is about 100 feet deep, which means you need a pretty long rope. I don't know whether that was the depth of the... Uh, the water in the well, the bottom of it, but you needed a pretty long rope to get water uh, from the well. And, and if there was a spring, more than likely it was at the bottom of the well. So uh, she is uh, again thinking in spiritual, thinking uh, physically rather, and he's talking spiritually. And then she kind of switches gears a little bit. You know, who are you? You think you're you're greater than our father Jacob? You know, uh, and of course Jacob named Israel was the father of course was a common ancestor father of course the uh, the Jews uh, the orthodox or pure-blooded Jews as well as the Samaritans um, and so she's kind of you know uh, uh, questioning him as to you know who, you think you you think you're a bigger shot than Jacob than Jacob was who are you verse 13 Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. 
and 14 goes on to read, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up into eternal life. Now that should have been a clue right there that he was not speaking about physical, something physical. Now when he says thirst, thirst is a, uh, it's a metaphor for spiritual need. He's not in this context talking about the physical thirst for water, but it is, it symbolizes the spiritual thirst, the thirst for that which is spiritual. Let's take a look at Psalm 42 verses 1 and 2. And there we read uh, where David says, As a heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? So David is comparing the thirst that a heart or uh, that a deer has at a brook as he approaches a brook if you will to the thirst that he has for God and that is a spiritual thirst or spiritual need or, or desire also we can look at Isaiah chapter 12 and verse 3 Isaiah actually uh, depicts uh, one who is drawing a water out of the well of salvation actually you can look at that on your own if you will uh, but he is well let's take a look at it and, and I'm gonna just back up to uh, to verse verse 2 it says behold God is my salvation I will trust and not be afraid for the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song he also is become my salvation my deliverance therefore with joy shall i draw water out of the wells of salvation again this is speaking of spiritual salvation spiritual deliverance here from the penalty of sin the punishment or the power of sin and ultimately from the very presence of sin and he goes on to say and in that day shall ye say praise the lord call upon his name declare his doings among the people make mention of his name it, that his name is exalted and he goes on again using scripture to interpret scripture matthew 5 chapter 5 and verse 6 talks about those who hunger and thirst after righteousness or blessed and will be filled uh, and again we talked about john three of uh, six rather 35 about the springing up uh this this water uh springing up uh and it has living spirit it's living spiritual water that jesus is referring to and uh and and, and we could kind of summarize this by saying that this uh everlasting life comes only as a gift of the father through accepting the invitation of Jesus and the daily work of the Spirit. Once we accept the work of Jesus, we receive this living water, again, the Spirit of God, and allow that Spirit to work in and through us. That is the living water that flows from our belly to others, okay, and advancing the gospel and doing other good works, all the other good works that the Lord would have us to do. But the living water, the flow is the eternal. That's the eternal life that once a person receives this living water, they are receiving eternal life. And that eternal life comes through our evangelism, our actually sharing the gospel with all, irrespective of their station, irrespective of cultural differences, irrespective of race, irrespective of sex, irrespective of all the things that divide us verse 15 reads the woman said to him sir give me this water so that i won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water she's still stuck on the physical on on, uh, on a understanding what he's saying uh, from a physical perspective and her confusion should not surprise us again we might be confused if we didn't know 
as much as we do about the Bible. We would think that he was talking about physical water uh, to meet her uh, immediate need. And she's, she's saying, hey, if you got some uh, some clue as to where the spring is that I can I don't have to come a half mile and uh, and then draw this water every day uh, let me let me know about it tell me about it all right so now we're gonna move into the next uh, division the final division of our lesson uh, from the quarterly which is entitled and let's there's a question here let's let's see if we can answer that first it says, why is it essential for any lost sinner to acknowledge sin? Now, what we're going to see in this next passage is a redirection of the conversation. Uh, the woman uh, came to draw water. Jesus asked for some physical water and then turned the conversation to spiritual water, the spring of spiritual water, which is living water, which is eternal life and through the work of the Holy Spirit and uh, and now, before the woman can receive the spiritual understanding and receive this eternal life that Jesus is offering, she has to recognize her sin. And so the conversation is going to turn and be directed at her sin uh, and then go back to go to an evangelistic uh, effort on her part. Okay, so the, the third passage read as entitled hearing seeing believing and there are actually two uh, short passages covered in this section or this division the first uh, John 4 verses 28 to 30 and the second uh, verses 39 to 41 so we're going to read uh, from the NIV uh, verses 28 to 30 very quickly then leaving her water jar the water went the, the woman went back to the town and said to the people Come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Now, I need to say something about the intervening verses, the verses between 16 and 27. In fact, <laughs> let me just read those very quickly so that we have a clear understanding of where we are picking up here. Since 16, Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. Verse 17, the woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you have well said, I have no husband for you have had five husbands and the one whom you now have is not your husband in that you spoke truly. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain and that's Gerizim and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship Jesus said to her woman believe me for the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the father you worship that you do not know we know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews but the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. Verse 24, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. 25, the woman said to him, I know that Messiah, let's pay attention, is coming, in parentheses, who is called Christ, when he comes, he will tell us all things. Now, Jesus says in verse 6, Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. So Jesus is declaring himself to be the Messiah. In verse 27, and at this point, his disciples came and they marveled that he talked with a woman, yet no one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? So the, his disciples, now Jesus made clear that he was the Messiah that they were expecting. Uh, he told the woman very clearly in verse 26. Verse 27, his disciples, the typical Jewish men arrive and, oh, oh, you're talking to a woman. Oh, oh, you're talking to a Samaritan woman. What? But they, they knew that he was 
uh, op operating counterculture, if you will, and, and breaking all kinds of of uh, taboos. But they did not say anything because the Lord was the Lord, and the Lord had a good reason for doing that. And so they didn't even question it. But uh, but the woman, as soon as they come, and they are typical Jews that. You know, perhaps even though they are disciples of the Lord, uh, are disdaining uh, her as a Samaritan woman, and so she she leaves, and she leaves in haste. She leaves her water jar. Verse twenty he says, then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people. Now the King James says she spoke to the men. The King James said the woman left her water pot and went her way into the city and said to the men now it was uh, the reason for making the distinction there is she was doing something that was uh even for samaritans uh counter -cultural. Uh the women did not speak to the men in public uh even among the samaritans uh, as i uh, understand it uh, but she spoke to them and of course there were women uh, perhaps in the audience where they came along uh, as well when the men followed her uh, back to where Jesus was. Verse 30, uh, verse 29 says, uh, Come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Now Jesus had told her about her lifestyle, about her five marriages and about her living out of marriage or living with some out of marriage at that point. And so she knew at least he was a prophet. She knew at least that because he was able to tell her something that only God would know uh, uh, beside her and, 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 and maybe the townspeople. He wouldn't know that as a stranger. Uh, and she asked, even though Jesus had said in verse 26 that he was the Messiah, could this be the Messiah? So she's not committing to a belief that he is the Messiah, she's going to leave that up to the men to decide for themselves or the, the people of the town when they come out and hear him. And verse 30 says, then came, then came out the town and made their way toward him. So she really uh, impressed some people when she came in and she was telling about you know, this man that told her everything that she ever did. And of course, they knew, the town folk knew uh, and she was uh, 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 unabashedly, if you will, uh, telling them, hey, he told me that I was a tramp and then when this, that, and the other. He didn't use that language, obviously, but uh, about uh, my sinful lifestyle, basically. So then now, between verses 30 and 39, our, our lesson, our passage picks up at verse 39. Jesus' disciples try to get him to eat something, and he, he says, well, his food is to do the will of his father. And uh, uh, they were asking, has anybody brought him anything? We, we thought he was hungry. So in the meantime, again, the people are about to, to return or to come out to where Jesus is. So verse 39 begins. Many of the Samaritans, well, let, let's back up just a couple of verses. Well, we, we left off before that interlude where Jesus is speaking directly to his disciples. Uh, and, and do read that. I hope you read that in the, uh, in the back, as the back part of the background scripture. Um, uh, the people arrive, verse 30 says, they came out, then came out the town. Uh, and verse 39 says, many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So this, we need to understand, this woman had more than likely been ostracized by uh, the other women and maybe many of the men as well in the town. Uh, and then she turned suddenly into an evangelist and she's reaching out with such enthusiasm about this man that she met and about him telling her about her life that many came out believing uh, uh, that what she was saying was true. At least uh, they were, um, it, it says some were, some were believing that what she said was true. That was before they actually heard from Jesus himself. Verses 40 and 41 read, So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, 
and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. Now, um, Jesus, the, the word incarnate, they came out to him, and he is speaking uh, words of eternal life. He's speaking wisdom, uh, and uh, he's he is uh, speaking. He's doing his father's will and speaking the words of his father to these people. So, and they are so impressed by him, they urge him to stay. Now he was just passing through. Remember, it's like a three-day journey between Jerusalem and Galilee, going to Galilee. But they urge him. Uh, and so he stays two days and, and you can imagine in two days the wisdom and the life giving words that he spoke to these peoples and impressed them so much uh, that many more, it says, believe. It said some believed at the woman's testimony, but many more believe uh, when the, the word incarnate spoke to them directly. So. Uh, I, I, I'm going to read the conclusion uh, from the standard commentary here, or at least part of it. Uh, there are a number of scriptural references here to kind of sum up uh, what we hopefully have learned uh, in this lesson. And it says, Jesus' earthly ministry did not include limits based on typical human barriers. His encounter with the Samaritan woman is a prime example in Jesus' presence, many of the boundaries that we have put up or that others have put up around us disappear. And there are a number of scriptural references here. Romans 3.22, Romans 10.12, Galatians 3.28-29, and more. It says, as we find our identity in Jesus, we can become the conduit of mercy and grace to those we encounter. The living water Jesus gives us is available now and will continue to well up in us until we reach the age to come. The gift we find in Jesus is not stagnant, not a stagnant thing. It moves from old to new, death to life, lost to found, enslaved to free. It means we are saved. Praise God, praise God. And we are to allow the living water, the Holy Spirit, to work in and through us to reach all people. Again, irrespective of the differences, we are to ignore the boundaries that divide us and that we have mostly set up ourselves. Racial barriers, sexual barriers, cultural barriers, uh, socioeconomic status barriers, uh, we are to ignore those when it comes to advancing the gospel. Not to say that we don't recognize that there are differences. There are. But we are not to pay any attention to them when it comes to sharing our faith and sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I hope we have uh, understood this passage or these uh, a little better. We pray that uh, we will uh, act accordingly uh, and We'll just close it with a word of prayer, Lord. We, we do thank and praise you, Lord, again, uh, for the privilege of studying your word. And we pray for such understanding as you have given us of it. And now, Lord, let us go uh, and allow that living water to well up and flow through us to those who are yet uh, unbelievers, to those who need your salvation, uh, again, irrespective of, of the barriers that we have erected, Lord. To divide us, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.